So let's jump in. And again, folks, as soon as you have any questions, feel free to bring them up. We're going to start with a very broad and not simple question. Uh, and let's start with Michael and then go over to Shibley, which is, what is the current state of the two-state solution in Israel? Thanks, Michal. Uh, and thanks to everybody who's on the webinar today for joining. That is a good question, and uh, it pains me to say that the state of a two-state solution between Israel and the Palestinians right now is um, pretty grim. Um, this is an issue that has been trending downward now for a while. Um, I won't. Uh, Shib Shibley is the is the uh, public polling expert, so I, I won't go into I won't go into the the numbers in terms of support. He can do that far better than I can. Um, but suffice to say that on both sides, Israeli, the Israeli side and the Palestinian side, support for a two-state outcome to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been slipping. Um, in addition, what we're seeing on the ground, leaving aside the questions of public support, are certainly not encouraging. We do have this new Israeli government, which is the most right-wing government in Israel's history, on all sorts of issues but particularly when it comes to the issues that impact two states, this government is not a normal right of center government. Uh, I would posit that it's not even a normal uh, Netanyahu-led government, since you know we have recent experience seeing what those types of governments look like and, and what types of policies they undertake. The new Israeli government um, includes many, not only parties, but ministers and members of Knesset, who very openly reject the notion of a two-state outcome, very openly reject the notion that there can be any type of meaningful Palestinian statehood, and uh, are pressing forward on a number of policies that will harden Israel's control over the West Bank and expand its presence in the West Bank, while also making it very difficult to undo those policies going forward in a way that will lead to a two-state outcome and, and separation between the two sides. Um, I, you know, there's, there's a litany of things there I can mention. I certainly won't mention all of them, but I do think that there are a few that really, uh, that really bear mentioning. Um, one is this question of illegal outposts. Uh, when I say illegal, I mean illegal under Israeli law. There are 132 uh, settlements that are legal under Israeli law because they've gone through an Israeli permitting and planning process. And then there are over 200 illegal outposts, farms, agricultural uh, settlements that are illegal uh, because they haven't gone through the Israeli permitting and planning process. And also because in many cases, they are built on private Palestinian land. One of the things that the new coalition has said that they are intent on doing is to retroactively legalize those illegal outposts. And again, illegal under Israeli law uh, and, and give them the same status as settlements that have gone through the Israeli planning and permitting process. And that's the sort of thing that I think will be more damaging to a two-state outcome than anything we may have seen since 1967. Um, because not only will it, uh, will it all of a sudden overnight turn these illegal outposts, which contain somewhere between 20 and 25,000 Israelis into uh, communities that are legal under Israeli law, it will effectively eliminate the rule set down by the Israeli Supreme Court that settlements can only be built on state land rather than on private Palestinian land. Once you retroactively legalize things that have been built illegally on private Palestinian land, um, then it's pretty much even more wild west inside the West Bank than we've already seen. So that sort of thing certainly does not bode well for two states. And on top of that, we have the usual uh, we have the usual appetite for greater settlement expansion. Um, as an example there, the Supreme Planning Commission that generally meets four times a year to approve construction uh, now seems as if it's going to start meeting every single month. Um, so, you know, on these fronts, we're, we're not seeing anything positive. Um, I'll say quickly on, on the Palestinian side of things, uh, there too, uh, there is less and less appetite for two states for all sorts of reasons, starting with Israeli policies, but moving on to the fact that the Palestinian Authority is widely viewed as corrupt, incompetent, non-democratic. Um, and given that the Palestinian Authority is so uh, closely tied to the Oslo process and, and a two-state agenda, uh, it weakens support for two states more generally. <clears throat> and lastly, uh, I'll, I'll shift to the United States very quickly uh, before turning things over to Shibley. Um, 
the Biden administration is certainly supportive of two states. We've seen that rhetorically. We saw it uh, just over the past couple of days with Secretary Blinken in the region. He uh, was very careful to mention two states in his press conference with Prime Minister Netanyahu. He was very careful to uh, mention it uh, in his solo press conference after he met with President Mahmoud Abbas. There are all sorts of U.S. policies that he enumerated that are um, supposed to be in service of two states. But it's also the case that while the Biden administration supports a two-state agenda and a two-state outcome, it ranks very low on their list of priorities. The Middle East generally ranks pretty low on their list of priorities. And within that, Israeli-Palestinian issues and two states in particular, I think, rank uh, close to the, I don't want to say the bottom, but certainly in the, in the bottom half uh, of the things they're interested with regards to the Middle East. And so you know, when you have this combination of an Israeli government that is moving as quickly as it can to make a two-state outcome impossible, um, a Palestinian authority that increasingly has very little legitimacy and a Palestinian people who don't believe that uh, two states is ever going to be possible, uh, and a U.S. administration that supports two states but certainly isn't going to pursue active policies designed to get there, I think that it adds up for uh, a pretty toxic brew when we're talking about a uh, successful uh, two-state two -state future. Shibley, over to you. Thank you, Michael. Well, uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for hosting me. I really um, appreciate you holding these kinds of events. I think this is a time... Uh, of soul searching for everyone who cares about the issue, who follows the issue. This is a moment that is very painful. Uh, and the developments in Israel are really troubling for everyone uh, there and here. Um, I think that, um, you know, my worry always has been that the focus on two states, which is a not anything that is possible in any foreseeable future, it's really merely a theoretical possibility, with no one able to provide a serious path to get there in any foreseeable future, that that simply serves as a smokescreen uh, for covering up an intolerable reality on the ground uh, every day of the week. A and when I hear uh, the President of the United States or the Secretary of State saying, we oppose anything that undermines the, the two-state solution. Uh, when, when I hear, let's put the lid on it, not escalate, it suggests that the status quo is intolerable, when the status quo is, in fact, is absolutely intolerable. And we're talking about outposts and settlements, when, in fact, what we have is something that is uh, lost in military rule over millions of people that have lost it for five and a half decades with no end in sight in any foreseeable future. This is a lifetime for people. And let's get it straight. It isn't just the shooting, the ugly ones that we've seen, whether it's Palestinians shooting Israelis or Israelis shooting Palestinians. Sure, those are awful. But there is violence every single day that is invisible. How do you think you can impose a military rule over millions of people for five and a half decades, people who don't want you there, who don't want you in their homes, who don't want you in their towns. How do you think you can do it except through the gun, which is, of course, present even when it's not fired? And so there is violence in the status quo. The status quo is intolerably violent. And we camouflage that with this promise about some future solution that will get us out of there and instead every single day reduces the chance of getting there because we accept and we want to look the other way. You know, I, um, I've always asked myself, um, and I ask you all to ask the same question, what if you had children or relatives who grew up knowing nothing but military yeah. domination? and living under humiliation every single day of your lives. And you see nothing on the horizon. And they're now young adults. And you are looking to see what they would do. How many of us would not be, would, would be proud of them if they did not resist? How many of us would be proud of them if they did not, they did not resist their humiliation? Uh, I cannot imagine 
uh, that I would be proud of my children if they accepted to be humiliated every single day and to look at a future in which they will be humiliated every single day. I wouldn't want them to be violent for sure, but I would want them to resist. And how are they going to resist when there's such a huge asymmetry of power without the help of the international community? How are they going to be resisting without recourse to violence, which we all hope they will do? If we take away from them every conceivable way of resisting peacefully, such as clamping down on NGOs that record the humiliation that they experience, the intolerable reality that they live every day, uh, such as preventing them from going to international courts to pass judgment on what has taken place on the ground. And so how are we going to do it when we're taking the incentives for people in the Israeli government to do it when we're saying we're going to do peace with the Arab states between Israel and the Arab states with disregard to what happens in the status quo and the territories. Uh, we're going to take what was used to be an incentive, an incentive, uh, uh, peace between Israel and the Arab state as a reward for Israel making, uh, ending the occupation of the Palestinians. Uh, and obviously that has not happened. So I think that the problem that I have is, is the language and our focus and our sort of discourse is the two state dead or not dead is, is do we do this settlement or that settlement is a complete distraction from a reality that has been there for five and a half decades and is not going away and is getting worse every day. And we have people in the Israeli government who obviously lay claim to all of the land except for the people. And so uh, I think we need to really, the moment demands a different discourse. The moment demands a recognition of something that has endured with many people looking the other way. Mm -hmm. Really great answer. Thank you so much. Um, definitely a perspective that we oftentimes don't hear. And I appreciate uh, your honesty. I appreciate you bringing that perspective to us. And I want to ask, um, because I think, you know, what you've talked about in terms of this two state discourse, uh, you know, being being maybe a distraction or not really where to start. I know uh, Israel Policy Forum, um, who is partnering with us on this event, we of course, we have uh, Dr. Papa from from Israel Policy Forum with us um, has put, Israel Policy Forum has put out a report, an updated report, 50 steps before the deal that gets into not just, we believe in a two-state solution, but here are the 50 things that need to happen before that solution. So this is the last question I'm gonna ask and then I'm gonna turn it over to the audience, but I am curious to hear from you, Michael, um, when you hear what Chibwe is talking about in this reality on the ground, these systemic imbalances that exist between the, the, the Israelis and the Palestinians, the, those 50 steps, where do we get into addressing those issues that, that Shibley's brought up for us? And what is the role? And this was actually a question uh, in, in the chat as well, so I want to tie it in. What is the role specifically in the diaspora that, that we can play, that we can pressure our governments, that we can pressure our leaders to take so that instead of it just being lip service and us staying two-state solution without any real context around it, we are actually talking about implementing some of those 50 steps to get us to that place. I think, you know, every everything that Shibley says, um, everything that Shibley says is, is, is something I agree with. Um, and I think that it has to be addressed now. There's no question that uh, Israelis and Palestinians are, are living in a one-state reality, and when you're living in a one-state reality uh, where one side controls the other side, obviously it's going to be the Palestinians who are the ones who who suffer the most. Not to not to negate um, not to negate Israeli suffering or or challenges that Israelis have, and not to negate uh, violence against Israelis, but uh, there is a fundamental power imbalance here, and. Uh, as with any power imbalance, it's going to be the weaker side uh, that that ends up uh, that ends up bearing uh, bearing more of the burden. I think, um, and you know, I also agree that uh, simply simply saying two state solution and and peace process without doing anything in the here and now um, isn't like isn't likely to change anything. It certainly won't improve the situation on the ground. I think that um, part of the uh, part of the objective we had at IPF. In releasing uh, releasing this concept of, of fifty steps that are divided into political, security, and socioeconomic steps um, for uh, Israelis, the Palestinians, and the United States government, uh, is to try and figure out how we can improve things 
now uh, without waiting for a future agreement, without waiting for a successful negotiation, um, keeping in mind that improving the situation on the ground in many ways is not only ultimately the key to getting back to some sort of two-state horizon, but is also critical to improve the lives of Israelis and Palestinians today. So, you know, some of these some of these things in, in the 50 steps are uh, are more challenging than others. Um, I think many of the socioeconomic ones are currently either in the works or you know can easily can easily be worked on. Um, the political steps are the harder ones, um, and that is where I think progress is actually the most critical, even though it's the hardest place. Um, as Shibley rightly points out, when you have uh, coming up on, on 56 years of Palestinian statelessness and a military occupation in the West Bank with no real recourse for ending it, um, of course that is going to lead to despair. It's going to lead to all sorts of resistance, violence, and otherwise. Um, I think it's naive to assume that Palestinians won't react the way any other humans would react. Uh, and, and again, it doesn't it doesn't justify violence in any way. It doesn't justify terrorism. But I think it's important to understand the context in which this is happening, and that um, you know it's important to tackle the security aspect and to tackle uh, the tactical aspect of counterterrorism. But it's also really important to tackle the larger structural framework here. Um, and the larger structural framework is that you have Palestinians who, you know, have, have grown up decades, decades of Palestinians have grown up not knowing anything different. Um, and that simply has to change. And so, you know, we at IPF tend to tend to focus on uh, pragmatic things and, and, and things that can be done incrementally to improve the situation. It isn't always the most satisfying approach, um, but we are trying to move the ball in uh, how we can. And uh, this notion of, of taking 50 things that can theoretically be accomplished right now um, by all of the parties is our effort to try and move the ball forward a bit. Um, I want to tie in one of the questions from the chat and go over to Shibley uh, from the Palestinian side. I know someone asked in the chat about uh, uh, elections in the West Bank. Um, just want to find the question here. <clears throat> what can What can Palestinians do uh, to hold elections, raise the confidence of the population in a negotiate in a, in a negotiated outcome of any peaceful and democratic result. Oh, uh, you're muted there. Um, there we go. No, now th there are two two questions. Obviously, there's the question of whether elections would help in any shape or form alter the imbalance with Israel, which now is clear. It's it's basically military domination over the Palestinians, um, no matter what kind of governments, whether it's elected or not, in the Palestinian areas, that's not going to alter the basic nature of the relationship. But it is important for the Palestinians themselves to elect their own people. And uh, one of the things that has been uh, an awful development, uh, when the, the Biden administration came into office. Uh, the president of the Palestinian Authority, who has not held elections for a long time, felt that the administration's focus on, on democracy and human rights during the campaign in a, an America where we have a, a, a cultural war, so to speak, a values war, where the Democrats are more focused on, on democracy and human rights, that this is going to be something they will demand, that is the administration will demand. That's why he offered to have elections, not because he thought uh, it would help him. He wasn't sure whether he could win or not, but he thought at a minimum he would be more responsive to a new administration. He's just gone through a horrible period of relations with the Trump administration, and he was hoping to open up a new chapter with a new administration. He was responsive. What happened? Even as he moved away from presidential election just to have uh uh, parliamentary elections. The administration was lukewarm at a minimum, uh, gi given, you know, no green, you know, I don't want to say uh, the, the signals that the, they read is that the administration was not particularly interested in having elections. Administration was probably internally divided. They never projected a position that insisted on it. Uh, and he, he thought maybe he wouldn't do as well in the election. He would be embarrassed and he probably right. And therefore he didn't have it. So I think the administration 
uh, the Biden administration um, did not push on that. And I think um, despite all of the difficulties and the pain uh, Palestinians under occupation go through day in and day out, there was a certain level of excitement about the idea that, of the election. And we've, we have not seen that kind of energy in a long time. And that was uh, really swept away. And I even think that uh, some of the tension that, that helped the escalation last year uh, came out of this uh, you know, frustration as well internally, not just in relation to Israeli actions uh, in, uh, in East Jerusalem uh, and the war in Gaza. Thank you. Um, I know we have more questions in the chat. I'm curious, does anyone want to come off of mute and ask the speakers a question so you don't have to just keep hearing my voice for the next half an hour? I will read a question from the chat if needed. Uh, I think Barb has her hand up. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Let's see if we can get you unmuted here. Uh, asking to unmute here. Bailey, do you want to um, try to troubleshoot that? And I'm going to read a question that Barbara asked in the chat because I think that is a great question. And then we can try to get some folks off mute. Um, there was, a, there's, there is in its infancy talk of a newly created political party in Israel, the Equality Party in, in Hebrew called um, Israel, all, all of its citizens. What do you think about that? Is that a good next step? That is a party, just for folks that don't know, that is a party that is uh, that is going to include both uh, Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel as well as Israeli Jews within the party. Um, is that is 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 a is a political solution or a political party even the right next move? Do you see that creating any sort of positive momentum forward out of this conflict? Um, we can well, start. I can speak I can yeah. speak to that a little bit because I've followed this issue uh, pretty closely. And uh, my visit there uh, last summer, I met uh, with uh, a lot of people who are involved in this kind of move. Not so much this party. I'm gonna I'm not going to speak about the party. But the idea that the moment requires um, some um, uh, Jewish and Arab citizens of Israel who are like-minded and share values uh, democratic values in particular, need to find a path uh, to work together, that this is what the moment, um, uh, you know, calls for, particularly when you have increasing push to, to, to diminish um, not only uh, the Palestinians who are in the West Bank and Gaza, but also inside, look at the recent development in Israeli law that targets uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel inside. Um, and and so that that obviously moved one one of the people who has been speaking out on this is Ayman Oda, the head of the uh, joint list, um, and he has um, certainly uh, uh, there the are people who who are uh, coming uh, over from both sides. I think it's a good move. I think it's important. I think it's important to have an alternative uh, to people who want uh, separation, who who don't want democracy, who want a a tiered. Uh, a system of 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 of, uh, of tier discrimination, um, uh, and so that's good. In the short term, it wouldn't solve the problem. It wouldn't solve the problem because we have the powers who are there. And we know what the character of this Israeli government is and what it stands for. More importantly, I think we have to reckon with a reality that goes beyond the current Israeli government. The fact is that there has been a rightward trend among Jewish Israelis for a long time. The Pew poll showed 79% of Israeli Jews think that Israel, Israeli Jews should have preferential treatment over non-Jews. That's 79%. And that, by the way, is also a large part of, of, of the secular Israelis, not just uh, Jewish Israelis. Uh, according to the Pew poll, 48% supported expelling Palestinians from Israel. So we have a really strong shift to the right that happened among Jewish Israelis, which is why this, uh, you know, uh, Otsmai Yehudit and others have been empowered. Now, they don't represent a majority. Obviously, they didn't, you know, they, 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 their numbers increased, but the voice uh, on some of the issues 
might represent a broader number of people than the people who elected them. Uh, and so we have you have to reckon with that. That is that is a reality, but I think you have to start somewhere. Great. Michael, what about you? I think that any efforts at uh, joint Jewish Arab parties are, are, are great and, and important, but I also don't think it, it needs to be or should be limited to uh, cooperation within one party. One of the things that we saw with the Bennett Lapid government, which to me was encouraging, although I was uh, I was less optimistic than many about um, it continuing, was the first time you had an independent Arab party included in a coalition, uh, Mansour Abbas's Ra'am party. Um, and that in itself, I think, was uh, you know a, a first, but but still very powerful statement uh, about the possibilities of Jewish and Arab cooperation inside of Israel. Now, it led to a backlash. I think that um, it's pretty easy to directly tie the inclusion of Ra'am in a coalition to the rise in support, sadly, for parties like Otsma Yehudit, um, who spent the year and a half and as did as did Prime Minister Netanyahu, including in his CNN interview uh, just yesterday, um, who spent uh, all this time talking about how this opened up Israel to Muslim Brotherhood influence, uh, or that the coalition was was resting on on the backs of terrorist supporters. Uh, I think that rhetoric had a very unfortunate impact, uh, and you see uh, you see the rise in support for very far right ultranationalist parties that you know in some ways is tied to the inclusion of Rahm in the government. That doesn't mean this was a failed experiment or something that should not have been done. Um, you know, I think it's important to actually double down on it. I think it's important to push back against those voices. And you know, nothing would nothing would make me happier than to see Ra'am or or other Arab parties in future coalitions. And so I think that that's important as well. And I also think that um, in some ways that is it's it's a more likely scenario, and in some ways it's an easier lift than uh, constructing a successful joint Jewish and Arab party. Um, for for all sorts of reasons, but I, I think that um, listen, a Arab citizens of Israel constitute uh, you know exact numbers are difficult, but constitute somewhere between eighteen and twenty two percent of the population of Israel. One out one out of every five Israelis um, is is not Jewish. One out of every five Israelis uh, is someone of Palestinian descent. Uh, it's important that they be fully integrated into Israeli society and into Israeli politics. It's important that they feel that they are included and actually have a voice um, and a way to impact Israeli politics, as opposed to just saying, you know, hey, we have an Arab Supreme Court justice, or, or hey, we have a bunch of Arab doctors. Without getting the buy-in of one out of every five Israelis for some sort of common political project and for some common vision for society, um, not only is Israel always going to have a problem of real societal cleavages, um, but you are effectively telling 20% of Israelis that they aren't as important as the other 80%. So I think all sorts of efforts in this front are really critical. Um, and I desperately hope that the backlash that we saw from including Ra'am in the bennett Lapid coalition um, isn't something that, that is permanent and isn't something that, that dominates Israeli politics for the next few decades. Thank you. Barb, I see you've managed to take yourself off mute. So do you wanna ask a question? Oh, well, I, you've asked the question about the new party. I don't think anyone thinks that this party is going to end up being the dominant party uh, anytime soon. But I think that um, as we see what this new government is undoing, undoing uh, opportunities in education, uh, targeting civil society organizations that have always uh, been the bedrock of Israeli human rights uh, work, um, and and I think this the current government is fomenting fear and and encouraging greater separation. I think that the importance of this party would be not only symbolic, but if we think about the fact that uh, the government won by a very slim majority, and it won because progressive parties were not united in the Jewish progressive parties, and the Arab progressive parties were or parties, period, were not united. It seems to me that this, even if they had a small number of members of the Knesset, it could make a difference in terms of modeling the kind of values that I think the diaspora is looking for. Um, I'm worried that, uh, Shibley, just as you talked about, there are so many Palestinians who've grown up without any experience 
of democracy and, and hope, um, that's going to be worse as we go forward, as there are um, all kinds of attempts to silence shared society initiatives that many of us care deeply about. And that's what we really put our effort and our money in and our advocacy uh, in the diaspora. Um, if those opportunities are lost, how, where will children be in 10 years or in 20 years? How will we reclaim the Israel that we love that's the uh, Declaration of Independence? Okay, so mm -hmm. I just, I just want to know how can we, how can we make, even think in small terms, I'm, I'm not thinking in huge terms, how can we encourage the role model that says we can get along, we can be friends, we can do all kinds of wonderful things. That's the stuff that people don't hear about. So, and I'm worried that there will, that the current government policies will incite I'll, I'll violence, that'll be it. Comments on that? Okay, Jen. Oh. Shibri, I think you're muted. Yeah, you're muted. Um, I, I, I think I, I agree that um, any joint Arab work uh, that is based on uh, full equal rights and democracy is a good thing. Um, look, Arabs and Jews are destined to live together in the territory between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. And they're going to have to find a way to live in dignity, equality, uh, equal rights, uh, and respect for human rights of both. Uh, and um, any voice, any party that advances that is a good thing. Any joint effort is better than uh, one-sided effort. Uh, that should not distract us, though, as I said, from uh, the immediacy of the intolerable, intolerable military domination in the West Bank and the actions that are being undertaken by the Israeli government, even inside, that jeopardize Jewish-Arab relations, even in pre-1967 Israel. Uh, and because this project of uh, working together is a long-term project, it's a welcome project, it's an important project, is something to look forward to. But in, it's not going to bear fruit anytime soon. In the meanwhile, we have to voice our um, opposition. We have to take a stand. We have to uh, rally behind those whose rights are being deprived, whose human rights are being uh, de deprived. Um, and so I think we need to speak out. We need to have clarity. We need to have priorities. Um, both at the level of policy of the United States government, but especially among uh, uh, civil society voices, um, people who care, people who share values. And I think that's extremely important. And as you know, we are you know, facing, in a way, a global struggle. Certainly we're facing it here in America be between uh, you know, um, uh, democracy and uh, and, and uh its opponents. Um, uh, we have a values war. And I think we need to be very careful in, uh, you know, it, it, looking at the, the situation on the ground in Israel, Palestine, and through this prism of values at the moment, because the prism of future outcomes is not the one that is going to inform us about what positions to take today. Thank you. Um, I really want to, that question came up in the chat that I was really hoping would come up. And so we'll start with you, Michael, on this question. Um, I want to start and preface this by saying that both JSpace Canada and Israel Policy Forum are strong advocates of a two-state solution and believe in a, Israel as a Jewish, democratic, and secure state. But <laughs> I do want to ask this question because it's the elephant in the room. Someone is asking about what needs to happen to make the one state palatable. Today's support in Israel is around 20% max. Um, I also want to add to that that, um, you know, I know there is discourse around Israel at this point being a one state reality. And though we want to get to a two state solution, the reality on the ground right now is a one state. Um, can you, we'll start with you, Michael, and then go to Shibley. I'd love to hear both of your answers. What do you think about that idea of, of there currently being a one state reality? Why do people say that? Why does it look like that? And do you think that 
support for a one state solution would become palatable either for Israelis or Palestinians. So, uh, you know, I, as, as I think, uh, you know, should be noted earlier, and, and, and as I agreed with, um, I think it's accurate to describe what's happening today as a one state reality. That's a very different question from, um, from what would make one state palatable to Israelis. Now, um, I think there's a danger here. Uh, and the danger is that many of the people who advocate for one state, um, certainly outside of, outside of, uh, of Israel in, in North America and Europe, um, talk about it in the sense of a single democratic state. Um, that is not the type of one state that is going to be palatable to Israelis. Um, one of the most worrisome trends among Israeli public opinion at the moment is that more and more Israelis are supporting one state, but it's the opposite vision for one state. It's a Jewish but not democratic state. Um, and effectively taking the situation that exists now in the West Bank and making it permanent forever with, with no, no talk or possibility of reversing it. Um, when you ask Israeli Jews whether it's more important for them to have a Jewish state or a democratic state, the majority say it's more, if forced to choose between those two things, more say it's important to have a Jewish state. And I don't see any scenario in which uh, Israeli Jews will ever support a single democratic state if it means losing Israel as a, as a Jewish state. Um, and while I, that's difficult for many people, it's certainly difficult for many diaspora Jews, um, for Israeli Jews, it's it's understandable given the history of Zionism, given the struggle to have a Jewish state, given the history of Jewish persecution. Um, you know, we're uh, we're living now. Fortunately for 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 all of us uh, on this call who are Jewish, um, we're living now in in literally a golden age in Jewish history, where diaspora Jews are as safe and secure as they have ever been, and where. There is a sovereign Jewish state in the historic Jewish homeland. Um, I think it's easy to lose sight uh, of the long scope of Jewish history where Jews were not safe. Um, it's easier for diaspora Jews, I think, to, to lose sight of that. It's more difficult for Israeli Jews to lose sight of it. And it's one of the reasons why Israeli Jews are never going to never going to concede in any um, in any peaceful or political way to give up Israel as a Jewish state. So uh, I think that pointing out the ways in which there is currently a one-state reality is really important. Um, pointing out the ways in which that's inequitable is really important. Um, but I worry that people who say, you know what, two states is not going to happen, time to give up on it, and let's push for a single democratic state. Um, I worry that that is going to end up in a solution that leads to more bloodshed, um, more strife between the two sides, um, and an outcome that uh, that that people who uh, have one vision for this um, are not going to like when, when push comes to shove. Should we over to you? Um, so, um, you know, I, I, as you have noted, uh, I have a, a forthcoming co-edited book called The One State Reality, What is Israel, Palestine? Um, that is going to come out in a, in a couple of weeks. And, and uh, it has a lot of um, uh, thoughtful people uh, with different views is just you know not that not everybody's in agreement with each other um about sort of what to expect and how it to evolve but our take is not about the normative end where we should end um that is that um if you start with um you know the advocacy whether it's uh, the israel policy forum or j street uh, that is an aim they would like to reach um when you're looking at it normatively and you contemplate the idea so what is what is possible in Israel-Palestine, theoretically, that would be reasonably just for both people? I say reasonably just because perfect justice is going to happen. So reasonably just for poor people. There are only two. One is one state with full equality, democratic state. And the other is two states uh, that are sovereign, that are at peace with each other. There is no other way to envision this that would be democratic or in some form or another equitable. Um, now, each one has pluses and minuses. Uh, Michael pointed out to why many Jews want a Jewish state. Certainly some Palestinians want a Palestinian state, but that's besides the point. I said, there's nothing that's going to be perfect. Those are really the outcomes. Uh, now, none of them are anywhere near uh, likely in any foreseeable future. And none of us can 
paint a path that could get you there in practice, diplomatically, politically, or anything. So our starting point is not about uh, where we should end or what the normative uh, implications are uh, of a future. Our starting point is what is it now? And right now it is a one state reality. And when it is a one state reality, you're gonna need to pass judgment on the basis of that one state reality. You have to need to put some glosses on and make the judgment about the relations that exist through the prism of this one state reality. And what you will see is even uglier than when you're looking at it through the prism of a state occupying territories. And when you do that, then we have to grapple with the implications, both policy implications, normative implications, but we have to start there. And we cannot avoid that. The moment calls for us to start there. The moment calls for us to think not merely analytically and policy-wise, but to look at it normatively, because this is a moral moment for most of us, as I said, even in America, but, but globally, and certainly with regard to Israel-Palestine. And I think that is why I think that that prism of one state has to be the starting point of the reality that exists. Now, Michael said, we don't know where that's going to lead. Of course, we don't. And it may, in fact, be uh, indefinitely the way it is and unjust as it is. Um, but we need to understand that. We need to grapple with that. And those who want an alternative future are going to have to start with the reality as it exists today. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question. Raphael, I see you've posted in the chat. I'll invite you to come off mute. If you wouldn't, if you don't want to, I can uh, I can read out your question. Sure, I'm happy to as well. Yay, thank you. <laughs> and, no, I just want to know, like, I mean, listen, obviously we're talking about our Canadian group here. Wanted to know, you know, what would you guys want to see? The, how would you want to see the Canadian government respond? What steps can they take to actually make some tangible difference? And then throw in what can you know Canadian Jews here do to push our government to uh, take those steps? Uh, Michael, you want to start? Sure. So I'd say first, um, it's really important that any governments that don't like what they are seeing um, from uh, from the new Israeli government uh, be very clear about that and speak out about it. Um, you know, we saw Secretary Blinken. Uh, do that when uh, do that yesterday and the, and the day before. I think it would be great to see uh, more of that from uh, from governments, uh, particularly when given the opportunity to do it um, next to Israeli leaders. Um, in addition to that, I think it's important to also um, understand that Israeli politicians get real political benefits from engagements with foreign leaders and foreign governments. Prime Minister Netanyahu, in particular has made a political career out of um, elevating himself as, as allegedly the singular Israeli leader who can walk into, uh, walk into uh, any, any capital in the world and meet with whoever the, the president or prime minister is. I think that um, that should be used as a lever. Um, I wrote about a month ago that I thought it was a mistake for Secretary Blinken to be going to Israel for this reason, um, because it confers political benefits on this new Israeli government before they've demonstrated that they're willing to uh, pay attention to American priorities. And I think that it's appropriate for any government around the world to think about their engagement with the Israeli government, um, not in terms of boycotting it, but in terms of when you make a trip to Israel or when you invite an Israeli leader to, to, your, uh, to your home capital. Um, the other thing I would say is that Israel is very sensitive to international institutions um, in two ways. One, they're very sensitive to the perception, and perception I think is absolutely correct, that they are um, singularly targeted in international institutions. And they're also perceptive to the impact of resolutions criticizing Israeli behavior in international institutions, whether they are unfair resolutions or not. Um, I think that Part of the difficulty here is that so many of the resolutions targeting Israel do fall into the category of being very broad-based or applying um, a standard to Israel that doesn't get applied to many other countries, um, or kind of uh, you know uh, taking taking a very a very broad uh, a very broad broad brush um, to try to tackle narrower problems. I think that if 
the international community were to be smarter about this and craft resolutions that were tied to specific Israeli behavior and only addressed that specific Israeli behavior, um, then perhaps you know, you'd start to see a shift in how Israel responds to them and perhaps a shift in how they impact the politics in Israel. Because right now it's very easy when you have something like the current UN Commission of Inquiry, for instance, it's very easy for, for Israel to say, this is incredibly biased and one-sided and, um, and really launch a frontal assault against it. Whereas if you had, you know, for instance, if, if Israel were to retroactively legalize outposts and you had a UN Security Council resolution that was, that was addressing just the question of legalization of outposts, um, and didn't throw in all sorts of other things, um, then I think that that sort of thing would have a different impact inside of Israel. So uh, I'd, I'd, I'd list those couple of things. Should we well, you? Yeah, let me put it this way. Of course, I can't speak for Canada, but I can say about our own government, the United States, sort of. Uh, let me put it differently, which is um, obviously um, the Biden administration is very frustrated by uh, the current government in Israel and what it intends to do and plans to do and uh, what what has been doing, particularly with regard to settlements and beyond. Um, nonetheless, imagine that you say what you say. I, I I I don't support any actions that disturb the the possibility of two state solution. Or we don't support unilateral actions, and you're even with that ignoring what's happening. Uh, you know, the, the intolerable reality for Palestinians that, that exists in the status quo, as I said, the, the violent reality of military control every day of the week. Put that aside and think about how you might actually get there by just saying that in a diplomatically, whether you're saying it to the Israeli prime minister or saying it publicly, when in fact you're continuing to do exactly the same things that have made Israel able to do what it wants to do. Uh, and there are People speak of the uh, aid by the U.S. to Israel, which is you know about four billion dollars a year. But honestly, that's not the most important thing for the Israel. Israel is a relatively wealthy country, and probably could do okay. It's not something to be dismissed. A huge amount of money for any country, but there are three things that the U.S. has done historically that have enabled Israel to withstand uh, uh, to to continue its policies in the West Bank and withstand international pressure. Uh, the first is clear, which is shielding Israel in international organizations, meaning uh, employing the veto at the UN uh, when Israel is seen to have violated international law and therefore the consequences of that violation, uh, shielding Israel and other international institutions from preventing issues to come up or discouraging people from uh, going to international uh, institution to, to pass judgment on Israel. That's a huge one. The second is to provide Israel with uh, cutting edge military technology to maintain its upper hand in the region, to maintain its military superiority over any combination of forces in the Middle East. And that security, as it is called, is in fact uh, enabling Israel essentially to, to uh, do what it wants to do without having to worry about consequences uh, in that regard. And the third is uh, something that has uh, been really understated, which is the American effort that go into uh, building relations and peace between Israel and the Arab states without demanding that there will be uh, a, an end to Israeli occupation or path to an end to Israeli occupation or Israeli control or improvement uh, of life for the Palestinians. We've seen that obviously with the Abraham Accords and this administration, even as it criticized the Israeli government, has said, we're going to continue to uh, to independently try to broaden the Abraham Accords uh, to make peace between Israel and the Arab states. Now, just I ask, I don't say what the administration is, do I ask, if you are in Ben Gvir's position, uh, what is it that scares you about the benign statements that are coming out of the Secretary of State and the President. What is it that you would have to worry about uh, in your implementing your ideological far-right position and your very public ownership of anti-Arab racism? What is it that is going to, uh, you know, what is it that's going to uh, uh, worry you? And I would say nothing. 
uh, that our policy as usual has been enabling, that we have in a way been enabler of the moment of the status quo as it exists. And you know, unless we change that, no you know, uh, attempt to revive court negotiations or to uh, issue uh, statements that have no consequences and impose no costs on violations of norms and international uh, agreements and international law. None of that will have any impact. Thank you. Um, I know there's some questions that we didn't get to in the chat. I know there's some folks, I think, uh, on, on the Zoom who wanted to ask questions. We are running out of time, so I am going to cut it there. I will say, though, both of our incredible speakers today uh, can be found on Twitter um, and uh, post excellent content. And you can probably try to ask them your questions there, and hopefully they'll have something to answer you. Sorry to put you both on the spot like that but I will make that offer. Uh, as well, I wanna put in the chat a few of the things that we spoke about today, which uh, is the 50 steps before the deal from Israel Policy Forum, as well as uh, Michael's Coppola column, uh, and a link to the JSpace Canada website as well, if you would like to learn more. Oh, and I just wanna say, first of all, thank you so much, both to Michael Coppola and to Shibli Talhami. Um, these are, uh, uh, issues and topics that we often don't get to hear about specifically in the Canadian community and Canadian Jewish community. I really appreciate your honesty, your authenticity, and uh, the way that you you showed up and engaged with us today. Much, much, much appreciated. Um, and I also just want to give one final pitch, which is that at JSpace Canada, we are entirely, entirely volunteer run. We will be bringing you content like this every month. It is so imperative that we do this with your donations. The best way to support us is to make a monthly donation so that we can guarantee that we can continue to do amazing uh, monthly projects with you. We are open to all feedback. You will get a recording of this after the event and you are welcome to reply and let us know what you thought of the event, things you'd like to see in the future, speakers that you would like us to engage with. Um, I, please do look out for an email shortly with the donation link. Please do follow our speakers on social, uh, any other way that you would like to continue to interact and engage because these conversations are so important in our community. We hope that JSpace Canada can take one part in bringing those conversations to you and really appreciate everyone being here today. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Shibley. Thanks. Thank Bye. you, Michael. Bye.